Okay, folks, so let's dive right in. Nice to see everybody. A few of you here and there scattered across the planet. Uh, welcome to the courtyard with Allison and our guest today is Andrew Anderson Todd. Just a little uh, context for today. We are <clears throat> going to be recording this for the courtyard members for the next month and use it as a jump off point for some of your conversation in the next two sessions of the courtyard dialogues. And then it will be uh, launched publicly after we've had a chance to digest it in house. So if you, if you prefer not to be videoed, uh, feel free to turn your video off now. And uh, thank you for keeping yourself mic'd and the format will be, I'll introduce Anderson and the broader context of the series that we're, we're launching. Anderson will talk for about 50 minutes or so and then we'll take some questions. And during the question period, you're welcome to drop your question in the chat box or on mic and uh, do it verbally. So without further ado, to to not waste any time, any of our precious time, the Sense Making the Pandemic series is a attempt to bring in some guest speakers with a non-Buddhist perspective or some interesting perspective that we can adopt and see the world and the current events in a new light and to generate some, uh, in, one, to dislodge our own perspective, but then to wrestle or tussle with each other in the courtyard and really hear ourselves articulate various points of view, try things on for size and see where we can fall out in terms of cognitive dis tolerating cognitive dissonance and res trying to resolve various puzzles uh, that are relevant to our time. So we're happy to have Anderson Todd this, this month and then we'll have Lynn Bell doing some an, an astrology forecast in October. We'll have Dr. Ian Baker come and talk about the Shambhala prophecy in November. And then in December, I'll be talking about the rebirth myth. So I want to also just thank Allison at once and uh, always for envisioning Courtyard as a space for us not to fall into polarization of one camp or another, but to create a space for tolerance and multi-perspective of views. And thank you all for engaging in that possibility with us. And, and uh, we really, really appreciate that. So today, Anderson Todd is the Assistant Director of the University of Toronto's Consciousness and Wisdom Lab, uh, Wisdom Studies Lab, which is fascinating. Would love to know more about it. Probably not today, but uh, what, a, what a wonderful endeavor that is at the U of T. He teaches in the Cognitive Science Department or program and interdisciplinary courses on Jungian theory at the University of Toronto. And he also consults in private practice as a psychotherapist to individuals and as an enrichment education specialist to private schools. So if you're interested in the work that he does at the Consciousness and Wisdom Studies Lab, you would visit cwsl.ca. And in addition to that, he has a very extensive library of lectures on his YouTube channel, which is where I have been devouring his content of late. I find him to be incredibly astute and a gifted, eloquent speaker. So I would very much encourage you to check out his YouTube channel in the spirit of some of his colleagues like John Dravicki. This could be the new frontier of education, free and, uh, and very much unrestricted and unbound. Uh, so please visit Anderson Todd on his YouTube channel. And today's conversation and topic is entitled, Nobody Understands Ion, which is already a bold move. <laughs> Jungian Reflections on the Churn of the Kali Yuga. And this comes out of my interest in the convergence of astrology and philosophy and Jungian studies and alchemy. And so we're in very, very good hands with Anderson, who's adept and multilingual in all of those studies. So I'll turn it over to Anderson. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> Glad we could find the time. Uh, and hello, everybody. Um, I'll just say a couple of things to that uh, quickly, which is that um, uh, in terms of sort of the, the frontiers of education question, I was half joking with a colleague yesterday um, that I sort of wondered if I could release a long form alchemical seminar merely in the form of TikToks. And it seems like a 
a difficult task that would be funny, and we'll see whether or not uh, I give that a shot at some point. Um, the other thing that I'll say actually is that I am recently cross-pointed actually to U of T's um, a Buddhist psychology and mental health program, um, which is a, a unique uh, sort of gem of a program that's uh, been around for almost 20 years at U of T. Uh, and so, in fact, much of my work does uh, fairly directly connect up uh, with Buddhism and sort of the implications as they, uh, as they play out both in sort of the Western encounter with Buddhism, but also um, with that with sort of depth psychology and with cognitive science. So I like to wear a lot of psychological hats. Um, so um, jumping, in, jumping in on this quickly, I will sort of preface a little bit by um, saying that the opening title of the talk, Nobody Understands Ion, is properly in scare quotes. And the reason for that is that I'm actually quoting uh, a colleague, a Jungian analyst, uh, who I met uh, when I was first in my undergraduate degree. Uh, and at the time, I was taking over the uh, Jungian Society at U of T. I was sort of taking over the presidency. And as part of that, we had a sort of a series of contacts with the um, Jungian Analyst Associations here in Toronto. Uh, and so I met them for lunch. And uh, he, at one point, was running something of a strange kind of informal interview on me uh, and had me do some impromptu dream interpretation over a Cobb salad, which was odd. Uh, but when we got talking about sort of where, where I was or what I was currently doing in terms of my Jungian reading, he asked, and I said, ah, oh, yes, I'm, I'm reading Ion this summer. That's sort of my project. Uh, and he said, mm, nobody understands Ion. <laughs> and we had a short conversation on this. Um, and I, it, I must say that it sort of galvanized me in a sense to understand ION. So while I have it in scare quotes, nobody understands ION, I do not think that that is in fact the case. The book is very dense and certainly we will not even come close to exhausting uh, the depth of interesting insights and so on that can be, can be found in it and in the various expositions of it uh, within an hour. But nevertheless, I think that the book does have some very interesting implications for the period in which we find ourselves. And, um, you know, sort of both, both culturally and in terms of the overall progression of sort of the, the historical psyche, which I'll explore a little bit as we go. So um, before I start touching on Jung, and I realize that not everybody is that familiar with Jung, so I'll try to do a bit of groundwork to sort of establish the, the basics there so that we can get into um, the deeper conceptual uh, reads. The first thing that I want to say is that I think it is increasingly either implicitly or explicitly uh, clear to people that we are very deep into an age of anxiety. And when I say this, I mean not only that we have suffered, of course, massive you know, cultural and personal disruptions um, due to the COVID pandemic, right? That certainly has been a trigger point, but that there are also a converging set of other crises of various forms. Um, any which, any one of which could theoretically be sort of quite devastating at the cultural level and convergently are uh, very nearly overwhelming, right? So depending on where your position is on these things, you know, we're simultaneously facing a kind of economic crisis. We're facing a scientific crisis, both in terms of its replication a lot of the time, but also in terms of what the role of science is going to be in society and how it can usefully connect with um, our own experience and our, our lived experience as human beings. Uh, we have a massive environmental crisis. We have an energy crisis. Um, so these crises are all sort of converging on us all at once. And I think that the um, feedback loops in a sense that are forming between them are becoming sort of increasingly clear, but also very unpredictable. On top of that, there is an analysis by my, my very good friend and colleague, John Verveke, uh, that we are also suffering a meaning crisis which is to say that the progress of the, you know, sort of Western world and the world at large by, by sort of um, uh, implication um, over the last 2,500 years has led us down a path where we are increasingly divorced from our sense of meaning and our sense of nature and where our scientific explorations in this sense, um, of course, have distanced us from, from, uh, certain kinds of earlier, more integrated understandings of ourselves and reality, you know, we're left in this state where we are very much divorced from reality. We're alienated from reality, 
right? The, from Descartes onwards, sort of the mind is over here and the world is over here. And trying to figure out how those two things connect has proven to be an exceptionally difficult problem. Now, initially, that was a relatively sort of specialist concern, um, you know, mostly confined to sort of philosophers. But as the scientific worldview in a relatively materialistic formulation has spread, we see sort of increasing amounts of ennui and nihilism from people who are first often reacting from a sort of Newtonian, the world is a, is a big clock and everything is predetermined and nothing has any meaning sort of perspective, but also from sort of a Darwinian perspective that we're nothing but competing genes and that our lives possess no, no other depth and no other meaning. Now, John's particular analysis of the meaning crisis, which is one that is closely allied to mine, um, is that the way forward through this is not to retreat back into a kind of fundamentalist rejection of what we've discovered, but rather to find our way through our various um, intellectual and spiritual disciplines to a reconnection with the world. And that in so doing, we will learn to uh, understand the process by which meaning comes to be, uh, and thus right, reconnect ourselves with the world and reground ourselves into sort of reality in a new sense and a new metaphysic. So that is sort of the, the standpoint that I'm talking about when I refer to the Kali Yuga. Things are rough uh, and they appear to be getting considerably rougher. And if you um, follow projections in any number of those sort of crises, you can see that they're intersecting in a way that you know, looks increasingly dire. Where COVID fits in on that question, um, I, I think at any rate, uh, is that COVID seems to have above and beyond the immediate effects of the pandemic, which are awful. Uh, it has also shattered people's sense of continuity in sort of the track, the series of check boxes that we are told within our culture, if we check them off, lead to the good life. And it has simultaneously revealed a fact that probably was always the case, but that leadership uh, world leadership is not significantly better positioned um, and not significantly wiser or more insightful or foresightful uh, than the rest of us. That in a sense, there isn't anybody at the wheel uh, and things are sort of stumbling forward at relatively high speed. So the disruption that COVID brought about has really, I think, and particularly in younger generations, brought about an enormous amount of anxiety because it seems like the, the social contract is, has been disrupted. This is not what is supposed to be happening. As such, um, and I say this as a clinician, the upsurge of uh, mental health material around this is, um, you know, it's a, it's a tidal wave of anxiety, of depression, of um, a, a lot of frankly obsessive compulsive um, material. But above and beyond that, this sort of breakdown in the framework of meaning um, also causes people to fairly anxiously attach to often relatively sort of ill-considered systems of replacement meaning. And so we see a real flowering of conspiratorial thinking, for instance. Now, if you think about it for a second, I think that, you know, when you encounter a massive disruption like COVID that reveals that the scheme that you've been operating according to, you know, isn't holding up, you have sort of three rough um, possible positions you can take. You can take a position of sort of denialism. You can say, no, no, it's fine. Everything is fine. Everything is going to go back to normal any minute now, right? Business as usual, it's fine. But that becomes increasingly untenable as the stresses pile up. You can adopt the position which, which I suggested, which is, oh, it turns out that there, there are not actually a lot of grown-ups around in charge and that people are merely sort of making it up, right? Um, which I think, uh, you know, is a very difficult position to hold. It holds a great deal of uncertainty, a great deal of ambivalence, right? Or you can decide that the, there are people in charge but that because the world is malevolent, those people are also malevolent and perhaps not even people. So you can come up with a conception in which the world is essentially Gnostic and ruled over by demonic forces of various kinds, right? And that is a position which does a few useful things psychologically. It stabilizes your sense of uncertainty, right? But it also creates a delightful underdog status for you where you have the opportunity to be a Joseph Campbell style protagonistic Disney hero struggling against you know, the, the dark powers. Now, those positions are generally full of sort of inconsistencies. It's not to say that they are completely wrong. Of course, conspiracies do exist in the world. They just tend to be incompetent and small scale rather than world spanning and um, sort of uh, 
<laughs> I don't know, controlling every aspect of reality. But we can see, of course, that that tendency is a very natural tendency in the face of a destabilization of meaning. Now, this idea that you know, we are in some sense like hovering over the precipice of you know, collapse, right? And, and what Jung would call the archetype of the apocalypse is of course an, an old persistent archetype. It's not new, right? Many commentators have noted that the apocalypse always seems to be sort of just around the corner. It's always immediately imminent. I would argue that in some ways, our modern condition differs from those earlier positions um, insofar as we've gone through sort of two recent imminent apocalypses, apocalypsi, which, uh, which, you know, have some teeth to them. And one of them, of course, was the threat of nuclear annihilation during the Cold War, right, which I am a Cold War child and grew up with nuclear war dreams and concerns about the, the nukes flying, right? And then in the wake of that, even though that's actually still kind of a problem, we have this looming intersectional crisis, which is largely also marked by you know, the, the sort of primary concern of the environmental, but there are other aspects, right? Political decay and so on. Um, so it's always imminent, but the difference is, and there is a marked difference I add between the Cold War and our modern formulation, insofar as the answer to the Cold War and the problem of nuclear annihilation was actually quite simple. Do nothing, sit on your hands, do not push the button. That's it. That's all that had to happen for us to survive. Whereas the difference to this intersecting set of, of interrelated naughty crises that we're facing now, and especially the meaning crisis, is that the answer is change absolutely everything. Completely alter your mode of being and the way that you interact with every aspect of the world, ideally without having everything fall to pieces in the process. That is a complex problem. So where does this tie into Jung? So, Ion, as I said, is a very complicated book, and I want to give you a little bit of a sort of a basic grounding in, in Jung before we sort of touch on his ideas in that book. Um, Jung is, in my opinion, a remarkable and often, um, I think, underappreciated uh, figure within early psychodynamics. So virtually everybody has at least a sort of back of the napkin familiarity with Freud, right? It's part of our sort of humor culture. We can all picture a person lying on the couch. Uh, we can all imagine a, a sort of a penis zinger. Uh, it's not hard for us to connect with that material because it's very embedded in the culture. Um, and to his credit, Freud is an exceptionally lucid writer. Although I am identify as a neo-Jungian rather than a Freudian, Freud is lucid and frankly quite genius. He didn't invent the concept of the unconscious, but he brings it into the sort of the public forum of Western culture in a way that hadn't been done before. And for that reason, he gets to be in the Hall of the Immortals. I think that at least 50% of his work is wrong, but where he gets it right, I mean, 50% of everybody's work is wrong, but where he gets it right, um, he is sort of a remarkable example of insight into human development, human psychology, the human condition, and how all these things are operating on a, on a large scale in society. And he's a lucid writer. When you read Freud, he's very clear and he's very compelling. Jung, less so. <laughs> Jung is brilliant. But reading Jung for a lot of people is quite difficult. I teach a number of courses on this at the university, and I advise my students, um, I began reading Jung quite, quite young, at about 12. So uh, my sense of it, I think, was colored somewhat by that. But even though I've read the collected works straight through many times at this point, I find my experience of Jung is often very difficult. It's like slogging through mud. His, he's a, a, a very lovely writer, but his verbiage is, is heavy and discursive. He's often speaking in relatively abstract terms. It stretches over 50 years of work in which his concepts change their definitions, as we would expect with the evolution of work, but it still makes it a little tricky. Um, you'll liberally hit passages in sort of Greek, uh, literal Greek, which you will then have to go, you know, figure out how to translate or, or look up. But then every once in a while, as you're sort of slogging through the mud of this experience, you hit an absolute gem. And it gives you pause. You pick something up and there is a moment of profound insight. Uh, and so for this reason, and also the fact that his work, um, despite the fact that it's been uh, often kind of ignored in the mainstream, um, he, he, he has a forward-facing body of work that addressed 
such a wide range of problems that many people consider him less a psychologist than a philosopher. Now, as an analytical philosopher, he leaves something to be desired, and we'll touch on that a little. Um, he, he doesn't have the rigor, uh, for instance, of, say, Kant or, or somebody. But um, he nevertheless uh, has these sort of profound insights. And I think that many of those in Ion, despite the fact that it's a difficult book, um, are, uh, are worth extracting, right? worth digging for. So to talk a little bit about, about the history between Freud and Jung, um, you know, we all sort of know how Freud came on the scene in Vienna. He, when Jung first read uh, Freud's work, he was very excited because it connected up with ideas that he had had working as a psychiatrist early in his career, where he had begun to see patterns in the um, sort of um, experiences of the people that he was treating. So he was often dealing with psychotics and where many of his colleagues tended to sort of ignore the sort of material that they were producing, visionary uh, material that they were producing, he would actually listen quite closely. And he began to notice that there were patterns and he began to connect those patterns that were being individually produced by these people with patterns that he was seeing in mythological texts that he was studying. So Gnostic texts, alchemical texts, and the mythology of various cultures, right, as, as he was looking. And indeed, he also began to see that there seemed to be similarities of pattern between numerous different cultures, right, that it seemed as though, mythologically speaking, there were certain kinds of human universals. And indeed, that in terms of like human, um, you know, roles, right, within society, likewise, there were these patterns. And in many of these cases, when he was dealing with these patients, you know, he was hard pressed to find sort of a conventional way by which they could have encountered that material. These were not people who were wandering around in the libraries of Europe reading 500 year old manuscripts. And so the fact that they were having sort of symbolisms and, um, and uh, you know, images and things that were closely echoed within these texts struck him as quite remarkable and, and indicative of something. When he encountered Freud's work and Freud's focus on the, uh, the unconscious, he was really quite excited. He felt that he had found a kindred spirit. And when they connected, um, you know, they had a rapid fire sort of exchange of correspondence. Uh, and then fairly soon thereafter, he went to visit uh, Freud uh, and um, they really hit it off. Um, I would say that they had a, 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 a multi-year bromance to borrow the modern term. Uh, so they really hit it off. When he arrived, they spoke for 13 hours straight after he walked in the door. And at that point, you know, Freud was so excited by Jung and Jung's sort of adoption of these perspectives that he effectively crowned Jung the, the crown prince of psychotherapy. The idea was that Jung was going to be the inheritor, a slightly younger man uh, and, you know, sort of a, an intellect in his own right, uh, and that he was going to pick this up. Now, they had a number of conflicts as they went, um, and this kind of culminated in 1913, when Jung essentially broke from Freudian orthodoxy, and he did so um, in a couple of key ways that are sort of crucial to what we're going to talk about. So if you're familiar at all with the um, sort of Freudian system, and this is a bit of a simplification, you can think of the Freudian system um, as being, in a sense, hydraulic. And what I mean by that is that the ego the conscious center that we sort of normally identify with sits in sort of the center, okay, of the psyche. But there are two unconscious factors which are playing tug of war with the ego at all times, okay? Beneath the ego is the id. And the id is an instinctive, largely biologically derived repository of um, what we consider unacceptable desires, okay? So your appetites right? Sex, food, violence, these things that are underneath the ego. And the id is constantly attempting to sort of pull the ego down to satisfy those appetites. Over top of the ego, we have the superego. And the superego, um, it's a misconception to think of these as an angel and a devil on the shoulder, which is how sometimes people think of them. Rather, the superego is a repository of cultural rules and parental influence. It is, in, in a sense, your inner finger wagger. It is the thing that scolds you into behaving according to cultural rules, right? So you may not do this. It contains the taboos. It's no, 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 no. So you have these two fortunes in either direction on the ego. And you, the poor ego, is caught in the middle of this tug of war. 
Now you can see that in a sense it's essentially flick, right? It's sort of almost unidimensional. It does run more model he goes. Um, he he and Jung both actually steal the work of Sabina Spielrein, who uh, invented the death drive, if you've ever heard of the death drive, but we won't get into that stuff too much yet. The point is that for, for Freud, this tension exists and any unacceptable intent. Anderson, sorry to interrupt. Psyche, right? Anderson, to fall into the unconscious as kind of personal repository and can base. I can, yes. Oh, but um, you can't hear me. I'm getting a drag on your, on your line. Uh, give it a second to reset. Oh, dear. I've got you now. Uh, can I get a no show of hands? Everybody got him? OK, everybody. Great. OK, good. There we go. Go ahead. Good. Super ego is okay. where, I, where, where you doesn't seem out. to matter how much you pay for internet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So super ego. So did I did the explanation of the super ego get through or no? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So in this perpetual tug of war, Freud conceives of the unconscious, okay, as being a kind of dank basement repository where unacceptable contents drop. And when they rise back through your dreams, they occur in coded format. So this is why, right, within the sort of um, cliched Freudian analysis, uh, you know, did you see a knife in your dream? Penis. Pen? Penis. Long pole? Penis. Because the material ultimately links to Freud's ideas about your repressed psychosexual relationships with others and, and often with your parents, right? So this is the so-called Oedipal complex. But the point is that it is a relatively static repository, which has this sort of hydraulic aspect to it, this pull. Jung broke from this model in two important ways. One, he came to decide after sort of long uh, periods of contemplation that sex wasn't the only energy in town, that there were other energetic centers within the psyche, other forms of motivation that were not merely sexually derived. But the other thing is that he began to lean more heavily into this idea that he had formed early in his career, that to some extent, the contents of the psyche and the contents of the unconscious might not be merely personal, but that there might be a collective aspect to this, that there might be a shared element in our psychic inheritance and in the structure of our mind. So these two ideas, he first sort of proposes the non-sexual energy, which is sort of the heroic energy, and the uh, proposal of this collective unconscious idea were anathema to Freud. And uh, pretty immediately Freud and his disciples um, worked quite hard to push Jung out and shut him down. And if you have a chance ever to read their correspondence, you'll find Freud has a very nasty turn with words. Um, so Jung got pushed out. Uh, and at that point, he had a very dark period in his life. Um, he calls this his confrontation with the unconscious. Um, and if you read his work, it's obvious that it was an extremely stressful and disorienting period. If we wanted to look at it sort of um, in relatively modern clinical terms, it would appear that he entered an extended state of psychosis. So he was having a spontaneous upwelling of symbolic material that he found quite overwhelming, although he did manage to hold down a job. So he was sort of roughly a functional psychotic for a while. But the point is that that psychosis ended up being the ground from which he elaborated the rest of his system because he began to interact with the figures and images that he encountered during the state in a way that deepened his relationship with them and began to change, in some sense, the entire structure and dynamic of his psyche. And when he merged up with the system of the rudiments, of almost his entire system of psychology that he continued to elaborate over the next 50 years. Um, so these sort of elements, you're talking about the, um, the shared, the collect, um, inherit by virtue of being human. And th there are some metaphysical quibbles here about whether or not this means that we all share the same collective unconscious. He seems on point, we each get a cup. But the point is that it's not really purposes uh, here, but you can imagine that we each get a copy. So an example that I like to use here is um, an archetype of the mother, 
every human being has an archetype of the mother, right? Which is to say that every human being has at birth, right? A sort of um, slot ready in their brain to capture material about motherhood, predisposed certain ways to early objects. Now, one of the ways that I think is useful to think about this is that um, you consider a newly hatched So normally, of course, uh, my connection is unstable again, is it not? It's, it's yeah, coming, you're, you're it's coming in and out. Am I back? Yep, got you now. Okay, where did I drop off? So we have the, uh, the imprint that receives patterns, the archetypal patterns of the mother. Right. So um, if you consider ducks for a second, a newly hatched duckling will imprint when it emerges from the egg on almost anything that you put in front of it. Normally, that would be the mother duck. And then what happens? We know what happens. Little ducklings all follow in a line after the mother duck. They're predisposed to imprint on that object. But experimentally, you can show that you can make a duckling imprint on any number of things, a glove, a person, a ping pong ball. And if you make a duckling imprint on a ping pong ball in that critical window, you can roll the ping pong ball across the table and the little ducklings will all follow it in a line. They have a pattern of behavior and a pattern of emotional predisposition that is specifically linked to a moment in time that's designed to right, affect their social relationships, but can, of course, be modified in all kinds of ways. Similarly, every human has this whole. I mean, every human in a literal biological sense has a mother. Whether they you know, had a relationship with their mother, the relationship they had with their mother, whether or not their sort of mother was their biological mother, doesn't matter. The point is that there is a universal aspect of the human mind that is related to the concept of mother. And Jung would propose that this is sort of essentially archetypal. He expands that idea to all kinds of other things. Every culture has a concept of the warrior. Every culture universally, okay, considers up, cognate with good, and down, cognate with bad, right? Light, cognate with good, darkness, cognate with bad. You'll get some small countercultural variations, but basically it's, it's a cultural universal, right? So these concepts of the warrior or the mother or the father or the enemy or the magician or you know, the, the joker, these are things that we find in every cultural framework mythologically. And Jung believes that archetypally it's because we are structurally predisposed to them. So although there are many of these um, there are a great number of these sort of archetypes. The, we, and we don't have time to touch on the vast number of them. There are a few that are sort of in our immediate concern. So when I mention that Freud is an essentially hydraulic model, I'm saying that in part to contrast Jung's model because Jung's model is not hydraulic in that sense. It's dynamic, it is dynamical. For Jung, the psyche is a living thing, which sort of ought not to surprise us but nevertheless was quite shocking to people at the time. The psyche is the living thing. And indeed these sub components of the psyche are effectively speaking, sub personalities, which are operating within your mind, but outside of your consciousness for the most part. They can impinge on your consciousness, on your ego, right? And contents can pass between them and the ego. So things can float up in dream or in reverie, right? but they are themselves sort of agents which have their own perspective, their own methods, their own goals, right? That are not always working um, in the same direction as your ego might be. The kind of heart of this system for Jung is an archetype called the self, okay? And um, I think it is a mistake to see the self as being like, uh, like an immortal and immutable soul. I actually think that it has much more in common with a kind of Buddhist no self uh, idea in a way, in that the self is really the center of self-organization. So if you want to think of the psyche, you can think of the ego as being the center of consciousness, right? All your consciousness, everything you sort of normally identify as yourself and experience is happening in the ego. But the self is the center of the entire system, right? It's, it's actually the hidden center around which all of this other stuff and unconscious content in your mind is organized and orbits. 
I sometimes make the comparison here to um, the shift between believing that the Earth was the center of the solar system to switching over to the sun, right? Everybody everywhere in the world, um, well, not, not quite actually, the Pythagoreans knew and so did the church that uh, the Earth wasn't the center. But, you know, uh, until Copernicus, we all had this idea that, yeah, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and obviously we're in the middle, right? This is very much the position that the ego is in normally. The ego believes that it is the boss of the show, that it is in charge of everything. But that is not so. In fact, right, the real center of the system is the sun, right? The real center of the system is the self. That is what, in fact, everything is organizing around. And the ego, like all these other parts of the psyche, these other archetypes, has an important role to play. But that role effectively is organized and surrounding the self. Now, the other archetype that is going to be quite important for our purposes here is the shadow. And the shadow is essentially all of the parts of you that you reject. That might be things that you've actually done that you don't care to think about. And it might be things that are literally unthinkable to your identity. Every time you make a decision in your identity, I am a this and not a that. Every time you see your position as good and some other position as bad, you are relegating that opposite number into the shadow. And the thing is that the shadow sort of gathers itself and coalesces in the unconscious, but it is an archetype. It maintains its own objectives, its own perspective. And like an actual shadow, it is attached to your ego in a way that cannot be removed, although people very frequently try to exile it. Like, like Peter Pan, they often try to cut their shadow off of their own feet. Uh, and the effect of this is, of course, that the shadow sort of goes running around on its own, making your life miserable, but also that you typically get quite psychically sick. You cannot separate yourself from it. Now, a big part of the Jungian system is about the integration of opposites. The idea is that you are trying to bring yourself into a state of encounter and honest synthesis with the shadow that you have rejected and cast into the dark. Because many of the things that are in there are not bad. They're just rejected choices. And sometimes those choices have been externally imposed. If you happily drew with crayons at the age of six until some parent or teacher said, put that down, grow up, you may throw Where did I cut out? Crayons. Crayons. OK, great. <laughs> Sorry, so maddening, the internet. Um, OK, so if you had a good time with crayons, but then at the age of six, a teacher or a you know parent or something said, put that down. It's time to be a big kid. You may throw art into the dark, but that doesn't mean that it has no bearing on your life or your sense of meaning and potentials for growth. And one of Jung's points is that the material, a lot of it that ends up in the shadow, he calls the golden shadow. These are things that we can reach back and retrieve in order to find a new green edge to our own development when we get stale and tired, stuck in our old formulation, right? In our own fixed version of what we are. So that integration, that encounter with the shadow is very integral. It's sort of the first step of Jungian work. But in some sense, the ultimate step of Jungian work is in this encounter between the ego and the self. And the reason is that Jung proposes that the self is essentially indistinguishable from the divine. When the self encounters us, because it is the center of our entire being and meaning making machinery, whether or not it is God, and that's an open question that seems very difficult to resolve, right? It certainly appears as and expects to be communicated with like right, divine figures. It has that numinous quality. It tends to project itself in mystical and transformative kinds of states. And that's how Jung fits these kinds of mystical encounters between, right, it is in an encounter between the ego, right, our regular conscious ego, and this center in the self. So, okay, that unfolded quite a bit. Now I have to get to the meat. Um, so, one of the questions that emerges from all of this is, if we have this shared collective inheritance, is it changeless? Is it fixed? And some people, I think, treat the map as the territory. They misinterpret the model and think that it's more static than it is. In fact, Jung is quite clear that it is not changeless. 
that that the nature of the self, even though it is this transcendent and imminent and numinous power, it nevertheless can change and it can change at a cultural and historical level through time. So he has a very interesting book called uh, The Answer to Job, where he deconstructs the, the book of Job, one of the final books of the Old Testament. And if you've read the book of Job, it is a curious book because it is about a sort of a faithful man who uh, ends up having a bet placed on him between God and the devil uh, before the devil was the bad guy and when he was just an employee. And the devil basically, as the adversary says, I bet you I can get him to turn on you. Uh, and God says, you're on. And God gives the devil permission essentially to destroy Job's life, to see if he can shatter Job's faith. Job handles this actually pretty well. His family gets killed, his fortunes are destroyed, right? And finally, he has a sort of confrontation with the Lord. And Job, for a moment, presumes to question why this unearned cruelty is being poured on him. Just like, <clears throat> just Lord, you know, is this really necessary, right? Like, I've always done what you said. And God, frankly, freaks out. God <clears throat> throws a tantrum, effectively speaking, right? He says, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Canst thou draw up Leviathan with a hook? It's a power trip. He, he effectively bullies, okay? But then he, in the end, because Job holds his faith, restores Job's life, sort of, because he doesn't bring his children back to life. He just gives them new children, but you get the point. Now, when Jung reads this, Jung has a very particular interpretation of it because he sees this as an encounter at the archetypal mythic level between the ego and the self. And he identifies it as a particular historical moment of evolution in our relationship with the divine. What he says is that in this moment, effectively, God feels shame. And in so doing, right, God is suddenly knocked off of a kind of omniscient power driving perch that characterizes a lot of the old world religions and early Old Testament, where you can be quite capricious, right? Um, and this, in Jung's formulation, is what leads to, right, the New Testament, the incarnation of Christ. God decides to put his money where his mouth is and incarnate, right, in, into the world, suffer and die for sins, et cetera, et cetera. So this is Jung's fascinating and somewhat idiosyncratic reading of the book of Job. But the point is that what he's picking up on there, okay, is a transition in the very nature of the self, this centrally organizing principle in the collective, and in the ego self axis, to borrow a term from Edward Edinger, right? The relationship between the ego and the self, the relationship between the human and the divine is fundamentally changed. And that fundamental change is what ushers in the era of sort of Christian thinking in the West, which is to say the Piscean age. So to borrow this, uh, and this is where we start to get into uh, Ion proper. Ion is very concerned with the phenomenology of the self, these transitions of the self, what they mean on the historical level. And to describe this stuff, he connects it through to a kind of um, astrologically derived, although I think it's a bit indirect, model around the procession of equinoxes. So he says that the era, the Piscean era, right, the era of the fish is the Christian era. Christ is a fisher of men, right? And this idea of all the early Christian fish imagery specifically marks this period of the Piscean era, and I guess breaks it off from the Arian era that preceded it, I suppose, yes. Um, but what he also then points out is that we should expect that there may be another transition coming down the pipe. And indeed, this is the period in which we find ourselves, right, transitioning away from the Piscean and towards the Aquarian. So the question for then Young is, what does that mean? If the Christian era is characterized in certain ways, what is the transition that we're talking about? Now, the essential move that he makes is, he says, the sort of symbol of Christ is a symbol of like spotless, sinless glory, all good, no shadow. That is, you know, sort of Christ. God has this universally good character. But the implication of Jung's psychology is that much as the ego has a shadow, the self also has a shadow. God has a dark side, right? And this is something that, of course, we have struggled with philosophically for you know, thousands of years, the problem of evil, right? Why, why? Why is it set up like this? 
This is something that the Gnostics, for instance, who were sort of early Christian offshoots wrestled with. And they came to all sorts of conclusions about this, like the Old Testament God is actually a demon uh, and has us trapped in this hellscape, right? You can see echoes of this, of course, in other religious traditions, right? The notion of, of sort of being trapped in, in Maya and Mara, right? And this idea that we are, are sort of caught in some sense in something that is a bit of a prison. You can see it in Zoroastrianism and it, it occurs all over the place. So in sort of identifying that the self likewise has this shadow, Jung tags the transition of eras as being one where we are not merely focusing on the personal integration of our shadow contents into the ego and thereby becoming more nuanced, more flexible and more whole, but also that there is this larger transition where the divine itself is going to have to take on a more nuanced perspective. It is going to have to somehow reconcile its dark side. And that is the transition that he sort of proposes for the era. Now, that's a lot of very heavy abstract stuff when we're talking about that kind of imbalance. Like, what are we actually talking about here? And I think that there are sort of a few ways that you can wrap this around and, and think about it. One of the things that I want to point out is that because Jung is thinking in these long eras, because he's talking in terms of the, the procession of equinoxes, right, and um, astrological eras, we're talking about spans of evolution at a, a scale far beyond the merely personal. So these things take enormous amounts of time. They are long, slow waves in the collective, right? And so, you know, often, of course, because we're uh, an impatient species, we have the idea that there's going to be an immediacy, you know, the, uh, the imminence of the uh, apocalypse is like, and tomorrow, tomorrow, everything will change. Revelation, right? It's a very appealing idea. But his sort of, uh, but his notion is rather that this translation is likely to occur over time. And there's quite a resting passage in, in Ion, the first time I came across it, which sort of says, and we should expect to see this new culture sort of coalesce and manifest itself fully in about 600 years. When I saw that, I, I blinked because you just don't get, frankly, a much scholarship talking about timescales like that. But that is, of course, the, the sort of level that he's thinking at, that these kinds of transitions take time. Now, I might argue that we are in a form of accelerated time, that our interconnection, that our technological acceleration, that the, the sheer numbers of us may sort of compress that time into a shorter period, right? Um, pr progress such as it exists, um, definitely is kind of an exponential factor for us. And so maybe we're not talking about 600 years, but 600 years worth of stuff. It's hard to say. But when we sort of wrap this around and we consider where we are currently, I think that there are some very interesting implications for the crisis that we are about to go through. One of the issues that we have in Western society, in my opinion, is that we are extremely averse to discomfort. We don't want pain. We don't want death. We don't want sadness. We don't want tragedy. We don't want these things. We conceal death. We medicate pain. We escape tragedy. But at the same time, we know at some level that tragedy leads to wisdom in some cases, sadly, not in all cases, right? That going through pain often leads to growth. And where a concept like trauma, for instance, is typically treated right, in, in sort of the conventional West and the popular consciousness as this entirely bad thing, the mounting evidence shows that trauma is not that simple. It's, sim it's not that simple. We want to avoid trauma because we think it's just bad, bad, bad. But actually, there's increasing amounts of evidence for people emerging from states of trauma in a state of post-traumatic growth, right? Um, you know, as an example, people often, you know, you have a natural disaster and people will immediately predict that everybody is going to turn into a, you know, Mohawk wearing motorcycle cannibal. But in fact, what you get is the community, right, typically banding together. You get a massive increase in people's sense of meaning and belonging. In World War II, for instance, in London, right, during the Blitz, people that had been uh, deemed sort of like untreatable psychiatric cases took on critical roles like running courier packages and stuff. People felt plugged in despite the fact that they were in danger. 
right? And we see much the same thing. Um, there's a rather famous uh, earthquake that occurred in Alaska in the 60s. And when you look at what happened under those conditions, it wasn't just this devastating, crushing thing where everything fall apart and everybody it was dog eat dog. That just didn't happen. Likewise, um, one of my areas of research is, is psychedelics and psychedelic psychotherapy. And there is a persistent idea that people have that at all costs, you must avoid a bad trip at all costs, except that people have bad trips. And when you look at the data and when you look at their experiences, it turns out that bad trips are unpleasant. They're not something that you would seek out but they also are not some devastating crippling event. They often actually lead to significant growth, significant development, because a lot of the time what's happening there is that your mind is getting out of the way of something that you needed to encounter and didn't want to encounter. So we are going through a massive collective trauma, no question. And we already were, everybody is traumatized. Like don't make no mistake. Everybody is traumatized and everybody is small C crazy. I take that as, an, as a, an article of observable fact, but we are going through a massive cultural trauma and we're due for more. The question is, of course, you know, if it is indeed an unavoidable trauma, if it is an, in, in some sense an inevitable transition, whether or not the destabilization that we're going through can lead us to integrate ourselves into something that is more reflective, that crosses the meaning gap and that enables us to integrate some of the material in the way that Jung is talking about, right? To be able to reconceptualize our relationship to the world, to the divine, to each other, right? To the nature of being. Trauma and crisis are actually an opportunity. In passing through these things, as cultures have passed through these things before, we are going to change the shape of the culture. It's going to happen. And our civilization as we know it, may not continue to exist. In fact, it's very possible it won't. But in transitioning through a dark age, much as in transitioning through a dark night of the soul, what we are afforded is a massive opportunity to grow up, to go to the next stage, to get some kind of wisdom, to be in contact with the aspects of ourselves that we've been ignoring, and to put ourselves back into contact with the world and each other in a way that doesn't throw away what's come before, but that integrates it together and allows us to move into a place where, frankly, we're not so monstrous to each other all the time. So that <clears throat> is a very short version of why I think ION is relevant uh, to our particular historical period. Did I stay inside the lanes? 1254, not bad. Anderson, thank you so much. I feel high, high a little bit high. I must admit, I don't know what I don't know what medicinal medicine you've been doling out over the airwaves there. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, we could definitely use a, a post psychedelic uh, integration period with you. <laughs> well, if if we can arrange it at some point, I'm happy to come back and talk about this stuff. I know that that uh, trying to talk about something like this inside an hour is a little bit like hitting people with a fire hose, you know? So it, it's good that you're recording it because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you've hit a number of key points. Um, I wondered if, if there were any um, recommendations that Jung had in ION as a result, uh, some, some steps to take or some things to look out for some mm. modes of preparation, any practical uh, advices that he lays out? Yeah, so, I mean, in some sense, there's a continuity for Jung between the individual and the collective, right? Our individual efforts impact the collective. So in a sense, his process of analysis and what he called individuation um, is the, the way forward. It's a matter of doing it personally, but then also bringing those values to, to bear at a higher level. Um, you know, it's hard to put a box around that process. In practice, it tends to be, uh, it doesn't like boxes. It tends to be pretty wild and, and woolly in practice. But he sort of identifies that there are three rough stages of the process. So the first is this confrontation with the shadow, right? working with your own shadow material. The second is what he calls um, uh, the encounter with your contrasexual soul image. Uh, which is sort of a mouthful, but this has to do with questions around sex and gender and the way that we value things and interact with the world, our, our inner connections to our own unconscious. And then at the third stage, you are dealing with what he calls the masterwork. So he says, this is the apprentice piece, the journeyman piece, and the masterwork. 
And the masterwork is this work with the self. It is, as I said, a lot more complicated than that. The map is not the territory, but um, you know, the basic process of analysis that he recommends is you start with the shadow. You start by looking at the things that you don't wanna look at, right? You start by examining these parts of yourself that you've thrown away or that you do not wish to see as part of yourself. And there are lots of ways that he recommends to do that. Um, one that I recommend pretty strongly to people as just an accessible mode is, um, we're all fairly familiar with the concept of love at first sight. And some of us have been lucky or unlucky enough to experience it one or more times. But fewer people contemplate the concept of hate at first sight when you develop an instinctive, extremely powerful loathing to somebody right off the bat. And the thing is that in both of those cases, it's necessarily a, a matter of projection, right? When you have love at first sight, unless you happen to buy into a metaphysical twin flame kind of thing, um, you know, you are necessarily projecting material because you have to be, you don't know them that well. Right? your mystical sense of like unity it, it, that emerges and couples that fall into mutual love at first sight become a cult of two, right? Uh, that mystical sense of unity and stuff that you have has to be projected, right? In some sense, because you don't know them. But the same thing is true of hate at first sight. When you encounter somebody and you get an instinctive loathing, that has less to do with them and more to do with you. You are projecting your shadow onto them. And so it can be quite useful in those cases when you think about like, what do I hate? What do I think is evil? To try to find, you know, nuance. And it's not to say that you relativize everything. It's not like anything goes and there's no such thing as evil or cruelty or, right? That's not the case. But it is the case that a re-examination of where your own positions are, really taking a hard look at who you are and why you've made those decisions and why you decided to go down one road instead of another. This is sort of the, the start of shadow work. Um, it's also a lot easier in some sense than that like hard look at your mirror to really examine the, the you know, the, the spots on your banana. Um, so, uh, which is also part of it too. But starting with shadow work, certainly doing work with a Jungian analyst or sort of psychotherapeutic work. And there's um, all sorts of interesting, you know, books that, that introduce these ideas and, and Jung's ideas. But the basics of it essentially is like, if we can start with our own shadow, then we will be able to begin to deal with the cultural shadow. And then we can look at this kind of wider transition uh, and start to get a grasp over the whole process of meaning making that we're badly alienated from. Amazing. And I, um, I'm gonna, if anybody wants to put a comment in the chat uh, or a question in the chat, feel free. I'm gonna just, um... I'm going to leap, leapfrog on that comment because, you know, the, the polarization and the political polarization that's rife mm -hmm. seems to be an opportune time when everybody's feeling very dug in and defensive to really turn the perspective around and see what it is exactly we're defending and what we find so noxious. But I, I feel like that's not an easy sea change. That's not an easy turn. Um, no. But I think what where it comes down to, or what I heard you, it, it comes down to individuals making that choice before the, the actual culture changes. Specific people have to come forward, disarm, turn the light of awareness on themselves and have a deep look at what might be going on. And the other thing that brought it up is that, you know, a number of people in our group have had losses and near death experiences and um, upheaval. And I think you've just given a wonderful frame uh, for, for for processing trauma, using it as a as a rites of passage to reclaim some very deep wisdom that's actually needed. So I mean, this is very consistent with a lot of the Joseph Campbell material that we've already been uh, working through. But it's it's reaffirming and and uh, reinforcing. So thank you for that. So one question here from Karen: <clears throat> Such a thing as group young studies uh, studies. I don't know very many like ther therapeutic young groups, but of course I teach classes on this. So um, obviously we do that. Um, I teach a full year course at the University of Toronto um, and I'm quite insistent about it remaining a full year course so that you have the proper amount of time to connect and mellow. It's a very, you know, it can be a quite intense and personal experience. So certainly there, there is work that's done in that way. And you will often get sort of meetings of like-minded Jungians and neo-Jungians and Jung sympathizers because um, at the end of the day, we're all kind of geeky about this stuff. And so we like to get together and have coffee or wine and, you know, 
jam about archetypes and deconstruct films. And so you'll find that kind of stuff all over the place. Um, and certainly I've done lots of it in terms of organizing conferences, but also, you know, uh, either getting my students or my peers to like watch a movie that I'm like, you have to watch this. It's, it's, uh, it's an absolute initiation. You have to watch it. Uh, so you'll find that kind of stuff around if you look around. And I think there's probably a fair bit of that stuff online, although I have some hesitancy um, about that. Uh, not not least, in fact, because of the sort of political polarization stuff you're talking about. So, but um, but yeah, certainly there are sort of groups out there all over. And if you look, you can often find like a young society or a young association in in a city of any size. And then uh, one, one one question I'm going to pose to each of the speakers in the series is this idea that there's no there's no objective truth. Um, examples are you can find. You can find so-called scientific medical represent, uh, representatives that clearly show a dis dis division uh, around the virus, for example. Mm -hmm. People are, people are looking for that the archetype of the wise person, but even the wise person has dis there are disagreements even among wise people, which sure. leaves would leave which leaves pedestrians or people who are untrained or non professionals wondering what the hell is going on. Sure. Uh, do you have any further comment through the, the young lens about that and its possible implications? Yeah. Um, so certainly it is the case that I, I think part of the problem here, and Jung addresses this, is that we have a massive overemphasis on certainty. And certainty um, is not very reliable and not especially informative. So we can all think of other people who are quite certain about things that we quote unquote know are wrong. Uh, but also a lot of the time when we want certainty, uh, it's nowhere to be found. And when we have certainty, it's pernicious. Certainty, um, I think, is a bit of a crutch. And one of the things that Jung gets at is that you, we need to develop a tolerance for ambiguity if we are going to get at something that is the truth. Because the truth, capital T, probably exceeds our capacity. The reason that wise people disagree is that we're all humans in the room. We have limited capacities, we have biases, we have, right, we have limitations. And wisdom, to some extent, I think, is about having a kind of flexible response so that, you know, just because you have a hammer, you don't treat everything as a nail, that you, you know, use the proper function or the proper mode of thinking, right? Now, I'm inclined to think that there are some aspects of reality that are sort of verifiable or verifiable enough that I wouldn't bet against them, you know? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, our physical theories are extremely impermanent. The nature of science is to, is to go through revolutions. The whole point of it is to overturn itself, right? And that doesn't play well with certainty, right? Science won't provide us with certainty. It's just not, it's not designed to do that. It's not going to do that. It's, it was never designed to do that. Um, but I think that the Jungian position in part, and certainly what I would advocate is we need to increase our sense of not just the tolerance for ambiguity, okay, and the tolerance for ambivalence, the ability to hold opposites, but we have to develop a delight in it. We have to be able to put the mystery or the paradox on our tongue and let it melt like a connoisseur. And that could be hard to do, right? But most of us enjoy that at some level. We like a good paradox. We like a good riddle, right? We like a good mystery. You know, getting to the fact that we are at some level limited beings. We're a lot smarter than dogs, but that doesn't make us gods. We don't have unlimited information. We are necessarily, you know, making provisional determinations as we move through the world. The more we seek certainty, the more our anxiety increases, right, uh, in that sense. And so I think that you know, a big part of when we're talking about sort of absolute truth, like, ah, can we get at that? I don't know. But we can develop increasingly good theories. That's definitely true. Some of our theories have a tremendous predictive power within the scope that they're designed to predict. But when everybody gets out of their lanes and starts overstepping, then we have a problem, right? And of course, it is not uncommon for sort of authoritative subjects to overstep their lane, right? You only have to think about the popular scientist who, you know, gets on YouTube and snorts about how philosophy is a bunch of horse shit. And it's like, you don't know what you're talking about, right? 
And to some extent, I would say the same claim is true of the sort of new atheist camp. It's like, it's not that some of those critiques aren't valid. It's that you have an incredibly impoverished view of what you're talking about. Like you, you, there is very little nuance in your consideration. So this ability to savor the mystery, to let yourself rest in ambiguity, to develop tolerance for it, and then an enjoyment for it is sort of prerequisite to be able to take two things that are apparent opposites and bring them together. And if you think about that, surely being able to integrate two opposites in a meaningful and useful way is going to transcend any sort of limited fragment that you're insisting on, right, in contradistinction to some other fragment, because as best as we can tell, you know, the, the world is doing a thing, but our access to it is limited. Anderson, I'm going to leave it right there because that was a wonderful summation. Thank you so much. Great. And I, you know, you. Hope, I hope everyone's just as riveted as I am and that we continue the conversation next week in the courtyard. If you can formulate further questions, don't let the fact that we have to stop now uh, prevent you from carrying your thoughts forward. You can put them in the chat or the comments in online in the CSP uh, um, box and you can bring them to courtyard next week. But I want to, on behalf of the Contemplative Studies Program, Anderson, very, very nice to meet you. What a captivating synthesis. And I look forward to uh, talking with you another time because it's hopefully the beginning of a nice conversation. So best wishes to you. Thank you very much. Uh, a, a pleasure to come. I'm glad we had the chance. Uh, lovely to sort of uh, meet everybody. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, found it interesting. Um, and I hope everybody has a lovely weekend. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.